thank you all for being here. Now, if you've never been here before, uh, welcome to the Rap Consultant Weekly Webinar for uh, Emergency Medical Services. My name is Josh Gregory. I help lead the education team here. Now, all that really means for you, if, if you're new here, is that these webinars are really just a place for you to learn about the industry, ask questions if you have them, really start to get confident about what this space is, what it can be for you as you get into it. Uh, and, and I'm here to help kind of guide that conversation, make sure that it's a process that makes a lot of sense to you and that if you do have questions, we're here to answer them. And like I said, we are here live. So if you're here live as well um, and you have any questions that may come up either about what we're talking about today or anything about the space as a whole, we're here to answer them. Uh, so just uh, there will be a Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions that bubble up, you can go ahead and type it in while we're talking today. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the window that you're free to, to click on, enter your questions and, and submit them. And, and we'll get to those at the end of the webinar. Um, so um, if you haven't been to one of these before, like I said, we'll have Q&A at the end, but we always try to bring a little bit of content, a little bit of an update, some, some information that just to help educate you on this space as a whole. And today we're gonna to be talking about is one of the most important considerations in this industry. Uh, and really in any industry, uh, which is what insurance that you need, which ones you don't need, and, and really how do you can best save money and, and ultimately keep your drivers safe. You know, a lot of this is keeping your business safe, but also keeping your drivers safe that you, so that you can run a healthy business. So Hans Fakir and I, who uh, uh, will be running this today uh, and talking through all of this, and again, if you have not met Hans, uh, he has a long history in this space, both operating these businesses owning them, helping others to own them and get started with their own businesses. So Hans, if you want to go ahead and come on and, and turn on your video and say hi to everybody, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hello. <laughs> hey, Hans, you know, I missed a couple of weeks. So this, you know, it's great to, to be back here to do webinars with you. <laughs> it is, man. I'm glad to have you back. You had some good feelings, though. Leah and Shelby, they did their yeah. thing. So, you know, yeah, I know they did pretty good. Out. But it, it's always nice to get back into the swing of things. So, <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. So, so like I said, we're we're talking a little bit about insurance, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so, you know, really, I think just kind of as a as a first point, you know, a lot of people are looking at, uh, at getting into this space, and when you're thinking about it, you know, you may be coming at it from different parts of the country. So. Uh, it, it, when we talk about insurance requirements in just a second, is it going to be the same wherever you are or do you see differences state to state? Yeah, there's definitely going to be differences. Um, and the way that you can find out what your state is requiring, of course, you go to your state website. So you go to, for example, the Georgia Department of EMS and look in the search box for licensing, ambulance licensing, and it'll tell you all that's required. So like for Georgia, it's $1 million and a $3 million, $1 million per occurrence and a $3 million aggregate coverage. Every state is different. From my understanding, from my research, Texas is the cheapest uh, for some reason. But yeah, every state is different. You want to make sure that you get insurance that covers you just so you can definitely get licensed. Now, anything on top of that is really something that you want to talk to about with your insurance carrier. Yeah. And, and as you're getting into the space, there's definitely going to be conversations we can help with there of, you know, I'm just trying to understand what it is at a state level. Yes, there is um, places you can go online and, and see all of that info. It's pretty regulated, <laughs> as you can imagine. But we can also help, you know, either put you in contact with others who may have operated in that state or uh, Hans is operating in a few states himself. So a lot of times we can just provide you direct experience there. But I just wanted to start with that because this is a space where it's not going to be the same you know, in every state across the country and, and making sure you know that from the beginning so that you have an understanding of, you know, there is going to be some general things that are consistent, but you really need to know uh, the specifics for your state. So we're not going to have a uh, an answer right here for every single state, but just know that there will be a little bit of difference there. So we'll kind of cover the ground level, the things that should be there in almost every state, but know that there's going to be a little bit of uh, variability when it comes to your a little state. Bit. And there's going to be some states that are really fun to operate in <laughs> versus yeah, like definitely. Texas, Georgia that are easier. <laughs> definitely. And they'll just vary in cost, really, right? I think every state's going to require you to have, a, I think, a minimum of a million dollars. But again, they're going to vary in cost. And I want people to look at the state insurance almost like the state licensing fees. 
they're going to vary as well, right? Georgia had one of the highest licensing fees um, as far as, I think it was $2,500 for their application license and $1,500 per vehicle. They just did away with that in 2024. And now the fee in its entirety is only $270. So again, you want to make sure that you're getting the latest updated information and you're not overpaying or not underpaying or get, just getting the wrong insurance. Yeah, yeah. And and that's a, just a, a great point to highlight again. We'll talk about it a little bit later as well. But uh, these things change. These are, you know, when it's a state regulation, the state has the power to change it. So um, this is the answer today for a lot of these things. But just know that there's always the room where some of these regulations, some of these requirements could change year over year or even more quickly than that. Yeah. So um, let's start here uh, with, you know, for those who have been in some logistics industries, they may be familiar with this, they may not be. Do you have to get your own DOT number for this space? What, you know, it, it, and if so, what's, what does that look like? Yeah, the good thing is you don't have to get a DOT number. So you do need, like in the state of Georgia, it's called a VID, Vehicle Identification Number, right? Uh, it's kind of like the VIN, but it's a six uh, digit that goes on the side of your ambulance, about three inches long, required by the state, even the size of the numbers have to be at least three inches uh, high. And so that's the only number you need. We're regulated by the state. So DOT is not going to tell us as far as, you know, we're not required to have a DOT number. So that's a good, that's a, that's something we don't have to worry about. We don't have to check off. Yeah. You just got the state to deal with, which is why it's it. important to know what the state needs. <laughs> yes. Uh, Definitely. So, so that is very different than a lot of logistics industries. And it and it comes down to you're not really going out of the state, you know, and I don't know if you've seen it. Is there any difference if you are transporting patients across state lines, how that might work differently? Or is it all still based on the state? It's all based on the state. And, and in every state, the one thing that I know is the common denominator is you can actually transport to, let's say, if you're stationed in Nashville, you can transport someone to Georgia but you can't do uh, interstate, right? For inner facility, they transport, they call it. So you couldn't transport someone from one part of Georgia and then transport them to another part, unless you're licensed in that state. So the rules are the same as far as uh, how it goes in every state. You can transport to that state, but you have to do the returning trip to another state or your state that you're stationed in. Um, so therefore, again, it's not governed by DLT. Everybody has their state vehicle identification number, and you'll see that number on every ambulance. It doesn't matter what state you're in, you're required to have, I think I think it's six digit, five digit number on the side of your, five side of your ambulance. Perfect. And that goes for the fire department and for us private yep. uh, owners as well. Gotcha, okay. So that's, yeah, so that's, that's the starting point. Now, there are a lot of other insurances, some required, some not. So. Uh, we'll start with the easy one. Do you do you see most people use auto insurance? We're talking liability insurance uh, and and coverage for any kind of uh, damages to your own personal vehicle. Yes, so definitely in Georgia, you have to have commercial auto liability and general liability. So those are the two that it doesn't even matter what state you're in, Josh. You want to have those things. I've heard some horror stories of employees not strapping their patients. You know, there was um, a particular incident that happened for, at a major ambulance company. A gentleman was driving, had a person in the vehicle that was not supposed to be there, actually his girlfriend. Yes. And uh, one thing led to another. They veered off the road. Truck flipped over a couple of times. Patient died. But I'm pretty sure that insurance covered everything. And I'm not, and again, that's not going to happen. Typically, that's a one-off, right? But even for the little fender benders, I always tell my employees, pay attention to what you're doing. Make sure that you're aware of everything because we're a bullseye. We have a big logo. People associate that with money, you know, oh, ambulance company. You just never know, right? So you assume the worst, hope for the best, prepare for everything, right? And so that's how I have it. And I have insurance that, that covers that very thing. <laughs> so commercial auto general uh we have property coverage i have everything yes it's a little bit costly but i'd rather pay that monthly premium than pay a ridiculous amount out of pocket 
Yeah. And and I think that's going to be a really important just theme when you're thinking about insurance is there are some that are required. So when it, you know, a lot of states are going to require general liability and, and some kind of auto insurance. Um, but like Hans is saying, you really want that protection. It has a cost, but the cost to run without it is a lot higher. Um, one of the things that I'll really recommend and come back to at the end is when you're thinking about your insurance spend, one of the things you should do first off is think through the risk profile that you can tolerate. You know, I'm comfortable kind of just, you know, knowing that I might have an incident, but I'm fine with it. I'll pay out of pocket and I'd rather pay for that versus I want to have every protection. That's probably where I'd tell you to err on the side of, but you know, being, be, understanding what you're comfortable with is really important. And then, yeah. you know, one of the things you can do is just set a budget for how much you want to spend on insurance and kind of align that with the stuff you have to have and the stuff that might sound nice and, and adding it on, but not letting that expense balloon too much. And so you kind of align that budget with your risk profile and try to keep those in the same ballpark so that you know, you know, an insurance spend that you're comfortable with. And there's nothing wrong, Josh, if you don't mind me piggybacking on that, shopping around like we do on our own personal insurance, right? We're going to go to the progressives, the, you know, state farms, and we're going to see who's going to give us the best bank for our buck. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to certain things like, um, your insurance can vary depending on your loss history. How many claims have you filed in the past, right? Location of your operation. Where's your operation located? The radius of your operation. Your driver's history. You know, type of calls that you're going to run. If you're going to run ALS or BLS. So a lot of these things can factor in. But the overall, you know, operating expenses and what it takes in comparison to what you would actually make per patient, two patients can pay off all your insurance coverages, like for a truck, a fleet for about four to five fleet, uh, for a fleet about four to five, you can probably take care of that, those insurance payments with just two patients alone, right? Can carry the cost of maybe a fleet that expands from three to five uh, ambulances. So I wouldn't really harp too much, because like you said, I'm more concerned about getting the insurance than nickel and diming that process, right? That's one thing we don't want to be, you know, cheap with. Yeah. And one of the other things too, that I'll just recommend here and, and again, probably come back to later is one of the best things you can do is have an insurance provider or broker that you trust beyond just, you know, you know, that they're not just in it to pitch you. Uh, and so a lot of, you know, we'll make recommendations there and we're always happy to, to connect you with vendors there because what you want to know is that if you call and have a question or kind of talking through your business and asking for advice, that they're going to give you genuine help on and, and information on what insurance makes the most sense for you so that you can make that decision as opposed to just saying, well, we have, you know, 30 different insurances you can buy. You should probably just get all of them. Um, and so and uh, that happens. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can get you know, that relationship, that vendor you can trust, it goes a long way on this side of things too. And, and and you can build up to getting to where you want. But I've had mentees in the past that have some restraints with their capital. So they're not able to get the biggest policy, right? And they'll come back and they'll say, hey, Hans, my insurance coverage is 2,500 a month. I'm like, what? And so when I look at the, the breakdown, I'm like, oh, well, you got more than what the state requires. So make sure, again, like Josh said, you're dealing with someone who you trust that'll give you this inf the insurance that you need and not just anything that's going to help them make a, a bigger sale. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, because the right insurance providers know that if they oversell you, then you're not going to do well in the business and you're not going to be around for long. You want to find somebody who's looking to help you succeed in the long term because they make a lot more money if you stick around for 10 years than if they overcharge you in year one and it hurts your margins and you don't last till year two. So yeah. finding the right partners who are helping you in that business journey is the is one of the most important things when it comes to insurance. Yeah. Developing those relationships are key. Yeah. Insurance people and your billing people. Those are like <laughs> two on the hierarchy of relationships for me when it comes to starting an EMS. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we talked about the truck side of things. Uh, so workers' compensation is another kind of just big category of insurance. So 
what you know just briefly when you think that what are you what do you think there what does that mean to you for somebody who might not have heard it before um workman's compensation is insurance that will take care of your employees if they were injured on the job it pays a percentage of their salary and it pays for their medical bills right so that's huge again texas does not require workman's compensation so it's it varies by state to state so i think one thing that josh and i are going to stress no matter what we tell you <laughs> please check with your state ordinance please see what your state's requiring i know that josh and i have plenty of experience with route consulting but again it's really up to you to do your due diligence and find out if it's something you need would you prefer it can you even afford it but workman's compensation has saved me again we are working with people that are lifting you know the smallest patients to the most obese patients right and you want to make sure that you have the right insurance in place to make sure that can take care of your employees and your employees will value that as well so it, workman's compensation for for me and anyone who doesn't understand it it's a very key element of making sure that your employees are protected god forbid they were hurt while they were working and do you see many in injuries in this space? And, and what kind of injuries do you normally see if you do see them? Back injuries. Back injuries, little fender benders, don't really see a lot, but the back injuries. So getting back braces, um, I know this is might be leading to the next question. Yeah. Getting back braces, of course, training um, helps a lot with that. And sometimes, again, guys, knowing your insurance carrier, your broker, they can tell you about the right defensive driving courses that you can take to help lower your premium or at least give you points in the future towards you know a lower premium so there are certain injuries that you want to avoid and that's the back injuries getting back braces having power stretchers helps a lot um with employee retention you know and workman comp uh insurance claims definitely employees love those power stretchers they cost a lot but those are also the type of things that will help keep your your premium down. That's right. Because I mean, when it comes to workers comp, the the best thing you can do is make sure they never get injured at all. Because uh, you know, once exactly. the claim happened, once they're out of work, then you've got to deal with the claim. You're trying to, to you know get them back to work as soon as possible, get them healthy as soon as possible. Because every week that they're out builds up and it affects your premium. So the the best defense you've got is being proactive there. So all those things. Hans talked about, you know, the, the back braces, power stretchers, defensive driving, whatever you can do is worth the money. And it's a great point. Sometimes it's not just prevention. Sometimes insurance companies really will credit that towards your premiums and say, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, we'll give you lower rates. And I've even seen, I've even seen insurance companies that'll say, you know, we will pay for you to get back braces or we'll pay for you to get non-slip shoes for your employees because we know that it saves us because it's going to prevent stuff so having those conversations it comes back to like hey you know is there anything i can do to lower my workers comp and having that conversation seeing what they say sometimes you know we're afraid to ask for those questions of like you know mm -hmm. how can i pay you less money uh but you know in, in the long run insurance companies don't want claims either that's when they lose money they want to they want you to have healthy employees and just keep paying your normal premiums exactly definitely and you know you want to avoid that i haven't had a workman's comp claim in three years so knock on glass yeah i was about to say knock <laughs> on <there. laughs> yeah let's hope that that trend continues but again i think uh, uh we talked about this in the past and we'll dive on it uh, again, in the future, I'm pretty sure uh, scheduling people can help scheduling the right employees to pick up the right patients. You're not going to put, you know, employees that, you know, are going to have a difficult time picking up a, a heavier patient. You want to kind of think of those things. So if you're not doing a schedule, you want to relay that message to your supervisor, or whoever is your lead EMT to make sure that they're putting the right people in place for the scheduling so that way you can minimize workman comp claims. Yeah, that's that's a great point because it's yeah, not only is it minimizing that, like if you've got someone who can't pick up a patient, then suddenly you're trying to what find another driver, or find somebody to help, and then you're behind on the day because you couldn't get the mm -hmm. patient car. And so it's all kinds of problems that come up, and then your schedule's broken anyway. So whoever's handling scheduling, that is a a very important piece of the puzzle. Is like you can move all these puzzle pieces around, just make sure that 
the one that you think fits really does based on what yeah. the quality of that day looks like. And, and, and like we, we talk about an insurance can be that one daunting thing you really don't want to talk about because it costs so much. But in my years of experience, there's so many ways to like minimize your insurance costs. You can talk to your insurance broker and see if they they have the tracking device that you can put on your ambulance to monitor your driver's uh, tendencies back and forth. So though, there are little things that you can do to really make this not such a stressful topic. And this is just kind of a side question on what we were just talking about, you know, how you do have all of the patient information in terms of things like their weight and any difficulties they may have from a scheduling perspective beforehand. Yes. One of the things that the social worker will do or whoever sends you the referral, they'll send you the patient's face sheet and the face sheet will usually have the patient's general information, year of birth, you know, and it'll also have their ID and, and insurance information. But with the face sheet, it usually has the location of the patient, the patient's weight, age, what's the illness they're going through. So you have all that general information right there to make sure that you're making the right decision um, if you're going to even accept the patient, because it's really up to us, right? We're gonna look at the patient, the schedule, the location of the patient. Can we fit that patient in our route schedule already? You know, Do we have the crew to put with that patient if the patient is? obese so do we have the vehicle av available yeah. you know for or maybe a box ambulance that you want to use for a particular patient do you have the equipment now it's a lot of things that you're going to look at maybe moving an equipment from one truck to the next truck to dedicate that truck for that patient maybe having a lift assist there's so many variables but i take you do those for, you do this for so long that everything is like second nature right you're 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 looking at all those variables as soon as you see that as soon as you see that face sheet. So right there and then you know this is a yay or nay. And I've turned down patients before based on the weight. If I knew that, you know, I had a staff that I knew would not be able to lift this patient. And I said, unfortunately, we can't take this patient, you know, move to the next one. And social workers love it and your employees definitely love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's you're you're gonna have somebody who's very unhappy if you've told them to to go out and pick up and get a patient that they can't move and it takes them an hour to just confirm that they cannot move this patient and then everybody's unhappy the hospital is unhappy that you couldn't pick them up the patient's unhappy that they just you know were embarrassed and got moved and nothing happened and your driver's mad and probably tired and <laughs> and ready to and quit. yeah yeah <laughs> all of that job you know what and this is such a great conversation because all of this leads to other things right so now you're looking at, well, if I got a bigger patient, this is affecting my schedule because it's gonna take a lot longer to get them on the stretcher. So all these little things play a part in scheduling, staffing, you know, your routes, how early in advance do you have to get to that patient's house, you know? And are you giving your employees enough time where they don't injure themselves, you know? So do you need to get a stretcher board where you have to slide it under the patient and slide the patient on instead of them lifting the patient manually? A lot of things can be done to minimize patient, I mean, employee injury and workman comp claims. So I will look at all the things that you can do to minimize that from power stretchers to stretcher boards to, you know, lift assist to even to the way you do your schedule, you know, where you won't ever have to worry about an insurance claim. And then you just do weight trainings with all of your employees, right? Yeah, yeah. And have some, have some weights at your, for rec time to definitely. Sandbags. Yes practiced with <laughs> listen we did it at the fire department i definitely exactly. you just bring inherited it, it. yeah <laughs> yeah um okay yes, so, so when you're thinking about this do you do you typically see that insurance is one of your biggest expenses for the year yeah insurances can range from fifteen hundred dollars to two thousand dollars per vehicle you know or in this case i have a pretty good coverage right now i'm paying 1800 for two vehicles so you're looking at about 3600 for four so that is a pretty yeah. pretty penny when you think about it right the bigger your fleet the more it can cost but again uh the bigger your feet fleet maybe your premiums go down depending on your claims and they give you a, a bigger like they give you a discount for having so many you know trucks in your fleet so it can it can vary again but every year i'm reassessing uh different insurance companies i'm trying to see if I, do i have the best policy out there yeah. So, so that is, you know, what's, what's kind of your thought process? Do you do it at like the end of the year and do you 
Do you call your broker? Do you like how do you just shop rates everywhere? What does that what does that look like yeah. for you? Yeah, I know a month in advance. So I think my insurance, my insurance, the year ends in August. So mm-hmm. from May, I'm shopping around because sometimes it might take them a while to get back to you. But by May, June, I, I'm kind of already figured out, am I staying with the same company or am I moving on to something else? And a lot of them are like mortgage brokers, right? They're shopping your insurance claims to the same Berkshire Hathaway and all these other companies. So it really just depends. Your agent can make or break the type of deal you get. Yeah, for sure. And and I've seen that in, in a large number of scenarios where somebody said, yeah, you know, I can't get a better rate. And it's just, it's all about finding the right agent, the right broker who can yeah. who boots. A lot of times it's about, can they tell the story of you and your business to the insurance providers in a way to get you credits? And so that's that comes back to the relationship I'm talking about earlier, where if they know you, they can often do more to improve your premiums. And so you can't be afraid to call your insurance broker. That's I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, you put it on the head. I just got off the phone with my guy, Kirby. And really, it's the relationship we have with him that he's going to explain. And he's going to, I've seen people miss insurance just because the broker did not ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And so someone did not get approved for insurance. But when I called the broker back and said, hey, this guy's been in EMS for X amount of years. They said, well, we didn't know that. Okay, well, let's, you know, get this on paper, let you know that he owns a non-emergency and he's just upgrading to EMS. You know, a lot of those things uh are important yeah to make sure you get the right quote or any quote yeah and and, you know there's the feeling of you know i'm just gonna send in information and they're gonna get it for me but this is something where you do benefit from having real conversations uh read it it's just a click box this is this is one of those relationships you need to generate and and nurture to make sure that your premiums stay low (laughs) here over yeah definitely definitely Perfect. Yes. Well, uh, that's kind of the 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 main insurance things that we wanted to talk about today. Uh, I want to come back to a, a couple of reminders for anyone who might have missed the beginning. One, most importantly, every state's different, <laughs> so there are there's going to be some consistent things. But no matter what state you're operating in, if you've been operating for ten years in Georgia and you think you know everything, and you move to New York to start a new business. It's going to be different. So just make sure you're checking with your state website with other contractors. We can help with uh, providing experience and contacts, depending on what state you're headed into, but just know that there's a decent chance that there can be some variability there. Uh, yep. and then beyond that to really what you're thinking about in, in the insurance space is what am I required to have? So look at the state for that. And then what's my appetite? You know, how much more am I willing to spend? What are the other options that I could add on to kind of the bare minimum? and decide where I want to invest additional dollars and what the value it is. And really one of the best ways to decide that is by having the right relationship with your insurance provider so they can talk to you through those different options, give you the information to make that decision. But like I said, it is also helpful if like, you know, if you said a thousand dollars a month is the minimum I have to spend, the most I'll spend is about 1500. So what is the best bang for the buck that I can get for that extra 500 might be a way to think about how you you kind of structure your your insurance spend. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to say is also, once you get, like Josh said, the state requirement, it's okay to ask all the other questions, right? The worst question you can ask is the one that you don't, right? <laughs> the, the dumbest question is the one you don't ask. For instance, like you might want to cover your ambulance, but what about all the expensive equipment that you have in the ambulance, right? Most insurance policies, the state's gonna require that you just cover the ambulance. But you have to ask your broker, hey, what about property coverage? Do you have that? You know, you want to make sure that your monitors, your stretchers, anything, your iPads, all your equipment is covered. So there's a couple of things that you want to make sure that you have, right? You want to make sure that you have the $1 million policy that Medicare Medicaid requires, right? With the $3 million aggregate. So certain things you want to pay attention to. All the questions that you have i would say ask write down all the items that you have and you go to your broker and you you would ask how do i cover these items and these people what do i need i know this is what the state wants me to have and i have that but my office do i am i covered that 
with that, with any insurance, what insurance is going to cover my office? What insurance is going to cover me that even when my employees are, they have a patient on a stretcher and they're in the hallway of a nursing home and they accidentally drop the patient? What insurance covers me for that instance? So you want to go beyond the four wheels of your ambulance and make sure that you have, you know, your umbrella and your excess liability uh, coverage. A lot of nursing homes uh, will not even allow you to get a contract with them unless you have the right insurance that they require. So you want to ask them that and then take that back to your book, right? There's even cyber liability to cover you, uh, network intrusions. There's all types of insurance if you're, if you're working with limited capital, you want to definitely get what the state requires, but there's those extra little insurances that you can get that really does, it does not make your premium go up, right? My other insurance that I got, the cyber liability, I think that was an extra $600 a year, but when you break down the payments in month, you know, the monthly cost, it wasn't a lot at all. So pay attention to adding those things and, and they might give you the year, the yearly amount, but when you break it down to what it costs you a month, it's actually worth getting. So, right, perfect. So, uh, if anyone else has any questions, just a couple of other things I'm going to cover really quickly. You can type it into the Q and A while I'm talking, and that's your opportunity. So, if you miss it, you'll miss it. But um, <laughs> for for everybody who's on here, if this is your first time being on one of these, we've done these for months uh, over the last, you know four or five months here. So those are all on our YouTube. So if you're looking for, for more content, that's all up there. You can go to the Route Consultant YouTube and and every webinar we've ever done is up there. Um, we also do, uh, we will continue to do these every week and we have one-on-ones on our website. So if you're looking for more of that content, there are other ways uh, to get started. Um, and then I, I see a quick question. Can you help me get started in Tennessee and Texas? Uh, the answer to that is yes. So uh, Quinn, if you reach out to us, info at route, actually just email me, josh at routeconsultant.com and, and I'll help you with the next steps. We'll go from there. Um, but, but yeah, Hans and I are happy to help. We've, you know, seen it in a bunch of different ways. So just let us know, reach out to me, let, let me know kind of where you are in the process and, and there's ways that we can help. And in general, for anybody, wherever you are in the process, whether you're just thinking about this is maybe it's the right industry for you, or you've already got to the point where you've decided this is the right one, or you're already at the point where, you know, I've got trucks and I'm ready to jump in and, you know, I'm starting in a week, but I, I think I'm missing a few things. Can you help? Um, all, all different stages in this that we can help. Um, and we're always happy to provide that. And there's ways that once you've already started that we can connect with you, nurture you. Hans does all kinds of mentorship that I that I can kind of help you through and talk you through. And Quinn, I just sent you that email address too. Um, so uh, for everybody, if you're if you're still early in the process, the the easiest thing I would tell you to do is we have something called a summit summit workshop where uh, we have a digital kind of um, you can think of it as the two hundred one level course where you can learn about the space, and then we also have. Uh, a workshop that's in person in our offices in Nashville. So if you sign up for that, you'll get to come in, you'll, you'll see all the digital content, come in and meet with my team and with Hans to ask questions about your specific state, the part you are in the process so that we can really help you accelerate your journey and make sure that you're confident and know what the next step will be and, and all the steps after that. So uh, wherever you are in the process, like I said, plenty of content online, but if you just want to reach out to us directly, we can help you with those questions from there. Um, but other than that, I think that's the last question that came in. So Hans, thank you so much for being here and being on here and providing all your expertise. Oh, you're more than welcome. Let's get some ambulance owners on the road. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. All right. And, and for everybody who's on today, thanks for being here. And hopefully we will see you all next week as well. Thanks, everybody.